All right. <clears throat> well, it's good to see everyone here. And as we uh, jump in, um, we are in Galatians still. Um, and I say still, we're going to be finishing up chapter 2, uh, very briefly moving into chapter 3. Um, we're running Uh, dangerously close to not being able to finish Galatians at the time that we're supposed to. So um, I'm going to kind of probably go through some parts of Galatians quickly and not dig as deeply into everything. Um, but I, I do actually think that's okay. The most important aspect to stress during a Bible class is really all of the background information the, you know, the, the stuff that explains the why it was written uh, to give the tools to everybody to then go home to your kitchen table, set the Bible down and study it yourself. You're much more equipped to do that if in this kind of setting we are making sure that we're getting all the background information correct. Um, you know, because if all that you do is just pick up the Bible and read, you're going to have some issues if you never take the time to try to figure out what did this mean to its original audience, what did the original author intend by it, uh, and uh, figuring out a lot of these things that may not necessarily be specific from this verse or that verse, uh, but help to enlighten the book as a whole. So, I am a huge, huge believer and what's called introductions, um, you know, where you spend the time focusing on answering all the questions, and we're continuing to do that very thing as we are working through the text. Now, Galatians chapter 2, we um, ended up in this section, verses 15 through the rest of the chapter, through verse 21, and here we have, if it's not Paul talking to Peter, um, verse 14 at least is uh, an answer that uh, Paul gives to, Peter, to uh, Cephas or Peter. He says, uh, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And then he continues on, we ourselves are Jews by birth, not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And this is Paul making it very clear. Um, remember here, we, we talked about our funnel, and uh, you have Mr. Gentile, who wants to come to the cross and the uh, Jewish Christian, the Judaizing teacher, that is, would say that he has to become a Jew, go into the law of Moses, and by doing so, he will have demonstrated worthiness. He is made worthy. He he's becomes a Jew. And so it makes sense for God's covenant people that God called them the what in Genesis 12? I realized I was talking too much and I didn't get, I, I haven't asked you a question in the first minute, which means that the crowd will be dead for the whole time. So let me start here. Genesis 12, what did God, to them, what did God call Israel? The seed, right? Genesis chapter 12 promises to Abraham that Israel was the seed, and that's going to become a big topic once we get into chapter 3. For those of you uh, who have read ahead, for the rest of y'all, spoiler alert there for you, um, the Gentiles must connect themselves to the seed, and when they are, salvation through Jesus is given, is granted to those who are in the covenant. That's the way they thought of it. Because if a Gentile could come straight to the cross, what's the problem? Okay. 
Okay, they don't have to do anything, which means that that cross is now connected directly to what? It's connected directly to sin. I mean, you, you just have a sinful person in all their sinfulness, in everything that, that is, that they are just a sinful person, and they don't have to purify themselves at all by the law of Moses. They don't have to, to, to go in and become part of this. You mean a sinful person can walk straight up to the cross and find salvation? To a Jew, that doesn't make sense. That shouldn't be right. Um, in fact, if that person even then continues to sin to some degree, uh, which is kind of what, what Paul's going to get across right here, does that then make Jesus a servant to sin? That's their question. Does Jesus then become a servant to sin? If the way that it works is, is sin can be uh, connected directly to Jesus. So verse 17, if we endeavor to be justified in Christ, we are too found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? And what's his answer? Of course not. You know, meganoita, this is the, the most emphatic negative statement that, that, that he could make here in the Greek. You know, of course not, certainly not. Don't be ridiculous. That's about the dumbest thing I ever heard. All of those, I mean, those are not the words, literally. All of those, though, make sense of, to what Paul is trying to get across when he says, certainly not. Um, you know, that's, that's the idea. He says, because if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. All right. So let's start working through this, like I said, a little bit. <laughs> we don't have the time you know, to spend a couple class periods going through each of these words or anything like that. But let's start working through this. He says, if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor or a, a one who sins, goes against uh, you know, the law itself. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. All right. Someone explain this one to me. What is it that he tore down? Any thoughts? Where's Joshua when you need him, right? He's always nailing, getting all the answers to all the questions, right? Dave, over here, Mike. The old law. Okay. You, do you, uh, when Mike gets there, do you want to expand on that? No. <laughs> okay. That's probably the best answer that we're going to get tonight. That was fantastic. Uh, was that a joke, or is you just like, not really? No, I, that's, I, I don't know what else I can add to that. Okay. Mike? Uh, the gospel negates or overcomes. So. Okay. All right. So um, for those of you uh, who, those of you at home are unable to hear, um, you know, what Dave was said was the old law, the law itself. Um, you know, and I asked if he wanted to expand on the answer. He just simply said no. Uh, <laughs> but, but then he gave just, just a little bit. But yeah, this is what is negated. Um, all right, anybody else want to jump in on that discussion? Anybody? All right, up here, Mike, we got... Were you wanting to say something, Corey? Okay, so Cliff and then Joe. Well, he put away the old man, so basically he um, destroyed um, his, the sin that he was a part of, and um, now he's new. He's a new man. Why would he want to uh, build that back up again and become who he was? He was, said, I've been crucified with Christ, so why would he want to yeah. go back? All right, very good. Uh, and, then, and then Joe. Well, I was just thinking about how 
the uh, it, it, with the old law, they were constantly trying to be. Um, they they had all these laws to uh, that they couldn't they couldn't um, no matter what they did they couldn't uh, achieve. They they had all these boundaries and they were constantly crossing those lines um, and and breaking those those rules that they even they set for themselves and it says uh, that they that I died to the to the law that I might live for God and so it, it reminds me that there's freedom in Christ even even though um, there's all these laws, or even though there's all these um, boundaries for the, the the law that they're trying to um, abide by, and yeah. they can't. Yeah, very good. Um, although I would clarify that the argument that, that you know we usually talk about how they um, you know they felt like they had to abide by every single one of the laws. That's, that's, that's a Paul argument. That's what Paul says, and then James you know, makes the same thing uh, about it. Uh, but I, to be fair, that's probably not the way the Jews necessarily would have viewed it. Um, you know, they, they, would, they would have assumed grace by virtue of being in the covenant. Um, it, it was not a meritorious system by which you earn your salvation by you know doing so many works you know they they wouldn't have had that i don't think conception of it um but yeah it, it was a system that is going to be you know juxtaposed to what you have in christ uh becky bruce bb put in the chat um uh, now they are a little delayed so uh this might be answering a previous question but he said the temple and the Jewish old way of being justified by the law. Okay, all right. All right, so let, let's, put, let's bunch all of these together because you know, we, we have a, a lot of these ideas are definitely um, coming through. Uh, you know, Bruce and, and uh, what Dave said, the law itself or justification, the cleansing that comes from being a part of the peculiar people of the covenant. Um, you know, was Paul a part of that? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, how much stock did Paul put into that? A lot? Everything? Right? Um, you know, and, and I know that I, I said a few weeks ago that uh, Paul hasn't written his other letters yet. So referencing them, you know, he, he's, he's not going to be, you know, thinking about those. And then I'm going to break my own rule, because what does he say about the law in Philippians chapter 3 and his connection to the law? All right, you know, he's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean, he's, he's like super Jew, kind of, right? You know, uh, of the tribe of Israel or the tribe of Benjamin, uh, you know, to the law, a... Pharisee, right? And in respect to the law, what does he say he was found? Blameless. Blameless, right? Perfect. And this goes to what I was saying to, to Joe just a second ago here. Um, do you think that he perfectly kept every single law that there was to keep? No. And, and that's, that's, I mean, he says that often, right? But as far as being a part of the system and doing the works of the law and keeping yourself a part of the covenant people, Paul did it to the effect that he said, if there is righteousness to be found in the law of Moses, I nailed it. I had it. And yet, what does he tell the Philippians? That he counts it? He considers all of that to be what? Waste. Garbage. Right, waste. You know, rubbish, excrement is probably, you know, the proper word, or is uh, the word used in our house for so many years, poopy. Um, that's, that's the word 
that he uses right there. That he says that's all that it is when it comes right down to it because he compares it to what? Yeah, the surpassing greatness of the revelation. He compares it to what he has in Christ, and that makes all the difference. Whitney? Okay, I have kind of a squirrel comment or question. Okay. Okay, so all these laws, that's a lot to remember. Mm -hmm. So how did they know that they were passing all the laws down? Were they written? I mean, could they read? Or what if somebody forgot to pass one down before they died? Yeah, they, they did have uh, the law of Moses itself. This is a great question. Um, Dave, I think last week, what was it, 613? Is that the number that you said? That, you know, there are different laws that are found within uh, the law of Moses itself. And then you go into the tabernacle, or the, the, uh, the synagogue, and you got the, the leaders of the synagogues who want to tack on a whole bunch more uh, that is, how do you act actively do these 613 laws? Well, we're going to give you the traditions of the elders. There were people there to make sure that you never forgot exactly what they were. You know, they uh, acted like the policemen of the day to some degree as far as righteousness is concerned. Uh, so yeah, it's a very good question, uh, but they were there to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, so what he says, Paul right here, he says that he put to death everything. And I think it's really the idea. What did he tear down? Everything. That includes, uh, and that's his point, is by tearing down everything, and this goes to what Cliff was saying a second ago, who he was before, you know, and, and the, as a transgressor, everything else, all of it's done, which means that part of that is the law itself. And that's why he says in verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. When you die, what dies? You die, right? I mean, isn't that right? You die. <laughs> you know, your entire life is gone. It's over. It's finished at that point. And he says, I've died. I've been crucified but I live. How does he live? Because Christ lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm, st I'm still living. I'm still walking around. Um, I'm still doing what I, I need to do, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Therefore now, the life that I live in the flesh, I live by what? The works of the law? No, I live by faith. And the Son of God, who, loves, who loved me, gave himself for me. It says, I, I, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Uh, that nullifying the grace of God seems to be a phrase that is attached to their problem with connecting sin to salvation. And, and they're saying, look, if you're trying to connect sin to the cross then you are connecting Jesus, you're connecting God with sin, and you're pretty much making a joke of grace. You're nullifying it to some degree. And he's like, no, this is the perfect demonstration of what grace is, greater than anything that's found within the law itself. Um, which is why he then continues in chapter 3, oh, foolish. Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? All right, these are a bunch of rhetorical questions. I don't think we need to address these. Um, Y'all know, to, you can see that these are rhetorical questions, right? They don't need to be answered. The answers are obvious. All right, so 
we don't need to answer them. Okay, so we're, we're going to kind of just say these are great questions for him to say, you know, do y'all really think that the law is so important? Or is it about faith in Christ? Six, verse six, is where he starts to really move into the meat of what all of this is about. Verse six, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Boy, does that phrase sound familiar to anybody? I mean, first of all, you've probably read Galatians before, so maybe it does there. But I don't know. Have we talked about uh, some place in the Old Testament within the last month or two? Or I have no concept of time. I don't remember when it was. But it's been somewhat relatively recently, maybe. Um, where's this from? Yeah, it is Genesis, but Genesis chapter 15. What's going on in Genesis chapter 15? Y'all remember this story? God takes Abraham out and has him look at the stars. Mm hmm. Those are your children's feet. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. All right, very good. Uh, Dave said that God took Abraham out. Showed him the stars, said, count them if you can, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. Um, what, though, brought that about? What is it that Abraham said to God? All right, Lorraine said that he did not have any offspring yet, and God had promised it to him, right? Remember, he, he, he says, you know, God, um, just going to throw this out there, but uh, nobody who's come from my body is going to be my heir, which means that he's old enough to the point that he's thinking those thoughts, right? He says, uh, and this guy, Eliezer of Damascus, yeah, he, he's the one that's going to have everything. Um, and that's a, kind of a, a roundabout way of saying, God, are you going to fulfill your promise or not? Right? I mean, isn't that what it is? And then, as Dave said, God said, I got gotcha. you. Count the stars, if you can, so shall your descendants be. And then Abraham believed God. Abraham trusted God. Abraham said, remember we, talked, we went to not Galatians 3, but Romans chapter 4 when we talked about this um, and uh, it said in hope against hope Abraham believed even though he considered his own body as what as good as dead as far as having children goes and when he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb uh, you know he says there's no way hope against hope there's no way this should happen but God said it, therefore I believe it. And that faith was credited, accounted, counted, whatever you have there, uh, it was credited to him as righteousness. So that's the story that he brings up right here as well um, as we look at, at verse 6. Why does he bring this up? How does this fit? Our discussion right here. Because the Gentiles are of faith. Okay. All right. Um, because, well, first of all, who is it that, that, that um, has the issue over here? Who, who is it that is um, having Judy. problems with Paul's teaching? The Judaizing teachers. Okay, the, the Judaizing teachers, because they assume what about Abraham? Okay. Okay, that they were the seed of promise. So there, therefore, the answer to the descendants in Genesis chapter 15, the answer is Israel. You know, he will have his descendant, 
and then they will be numerous, as numerous as can be, and they will be the seed that's going to bless the rest of the world, right? So he is setting up right now, demonstrating, just as Mike said a second ago, that Abraham was justified by what? Faith. By faith, and not by... Works. All right, w well, works... Of the law. Works of the law. That, that this has nothing to do with Abraham himself. And then as Mike said just a second ago, it's connected now to Gentiles, and how are Gentiles being taken to God? By virtue of what? Faith, yeah, it, it's the same thing. They are acting more like Abraham. The Gentiles are more like Abraham in this scenario than the Jews. Verse 7, know then that it is those of the faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. All right, so now we have um, this discussion, um, and we're going to eventually, at some point, hopefully, later in the year, much later in the year, when we pull out Romans, um, there's going to be a connecting point in Romans chapter 9 back to this right here. But I don't want to connect it forward to something that Paul hasn't written yet. Um, I, I want to save it and connect it back from Romans back to here. Plus, hopefully we'll have more time in Romans to talk about it. So we'll save a lot of this discussion for then. Uh, but the key thing to understand is um, in verse 7, what? You can just read verse 7. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, Mike? Well, you, you get to skip the law. You go back and you, or you come straight to Christ to, by faith the same way Abraham came straight to God by faith. Okay. Yes. It is those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. All right. So, right now, the Jews are fixated on their lineage, right? So, you have the physical sons of Abraham... And that's what they believe they are, that the seed refers to the physical sons of Abraham. And uh, if we were in Romans, we would have a nice little diagram to go down. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to save that discussion again. So we'll just have a modified one here. Who does that include? Who is Abraham's son? All right, Isaac, then Jacob. All right. And then, I'm kidding, we're not going to do all 12. You, know, you guys are like, all right, who, who wants to be the one to list all 12? Um, you know, but but you, you have the 12, and then from those 12 came, looks like a hot dog or something. Uh, from those 12 came all of Israel, right? All of Israel is physically descended from Abraham. And that's where they put their stock, that this is what it's all about, being a child of Abraham. And Paul says, yeah, that's well and good, but what's more important than physically being descended from Abraham? It's not sharing the blood of Abraham, it's sharing the faith of Abraham. And these are all of the true sons of Abraham. We could say the true Israel are those not who are physically descended lineage by blood, but those who are truly descended by faith. Everyone who shares the faith of Abraham is part of the family. Which one of these was given the law 
to make them, to preserve them, I guess, and make them holy. Well, it was these over here that were given the law of Moses, right? The law of Moses was given to them to preserve their place until such a time as the Messiah came. Um, however, the law of Moses has nothing to do with this part of it once the messianic kingdom is in place. And so that's what kind of Paul, it's kind of what Paul's trying to get across here. He continues on the scripture foreseeing that God would justify uh, the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, what? All right, and you of all the nations would be blessed. Where do you find that? Okay, I would accept two answers for this one. Uh, Genesis 12, although probably more accurately. What's the other one? Someone said 22. All right, 22 is the one where they actually use the word nations. Uh, Genesis 12 uses the word families. Uh, but it, it's nations in 22. But it's the same idea. And this is the same promise, right? The promise in Genesis 12, 22, that's the promise that's under discussion. And so um, he says, look, God already knew. Way back when he first talked to Abraham, God already knew exactly what he was going to do. He already knew that the Gentiles were going to be considered fellow heirs, that they would be brought in and, and by faith, because he said, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, who was the man of faith. All right, everybody good, verses 7 through 9. Can you see what he's trying to get across here. That it's, it's about not the physical lineage, it's about the faith lineage, because Abraham was a man of faith, first and foremost. That's his main characteristic and his true sons, which include Gentiles, right? This, these are Jew and Gentile alike. It includes both groups in this. Uh, verse 10, for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident no one is justified before God by the law for the righteous uh, shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. All right. <clears throat> so, um, again, we're, we're like right in the heart of Paul's whole discussion about this. And um, who are the ones who rely on the works of the law? Well, it, it's these folks over here, right? You know, these guys. Because they have nothing but the law. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, what does it say? All right, very good. So Genesis chapter 18, 18. Um, yeah, I'd have to look at the, the full context of, of if, the, if he's saying that directly to Abraham. Um, but I know very specifically in Genesis 12 and 22, which kind of serve as, um, you know, pre-post birth of uh, Isaac, statements that you find there. But yes, thank you. Um, so, coming back here, um, says all of those who rely on the works of the law, that is, 
the Jews, especially those who are not Christians, they rely on the works of the law. Why? Brian? Because they have nothing else, right? If they don't have a Messiah that's there, they, they don't have a crucified Christ, if they're not Christians, then all that they have are the works of the law in order to demonstrate who they are as God's people. That's it. That's all that they are able to bank on. Now, this brings up an interesting discussion that we aren't going to be able to go into concerning um, the way that people before Christ were justified, were made right by faith, how they were forgiven of their sins, because it's very clear they were forgiven of their sins, even though the law of Moses could not forgive anybody of any sins, um, you know, as far as your, your standing with God. Um, so it all was based on faith itself. But he says, all who rely on the works of the law, they become under a curse. Because cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Uh, this is the point Joe brought up earlier, right? That, you know, all of the various commands, everything that was there, you had to perform them. And, and this is what Paul and James, really though, Paul really brings this out, brings it to their attention and says, yeah, don't fool yourself. In order to become righteous based on the law, you can't mess it up. You know, and that's what he's telling them. Uh, you know, he's taking it to the fullest extent. Now, that's not the basis of his argumentation, though. Uh, he says, look, it's evident. No one is justified before God by the law because the righteous shall live by faith. Where's that come from? Yeah, it's in Habakkuk 2. Um, you remember when Habakkuk was like, God, you can't use the Babylonians. They're really bad people. And God's like, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And the proud one, whose soul is not right within him, uh, he's going to have an issue with it. If he tries to tell God what God's supposed to do, he's too proud to accept it. And he's going to try to resist the Babylonians, resist everything, and he's going to feel the effects of it. But the just one, the righteous one, will simply accept God's judgment by faith. And he'll live by faith, and he will trust in God. Um, you know, no matter what, whether it makes sense, doesn't make sense, he still trusts in God. Um, all right, we are really running out of time here. So, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham would come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now, um, follow the um, pronouns when he says we, oftentimes, who's he referring to? Verse 15, maybe? Who's the we? What's that? Well, in verse 15, he says, we ourselves are Jews by birth. Um, you know, and I might be mistaken on this, but I think he's trying to make a strong connection between the reward that's received by Jewish Christians if it is also combined with Gentiles who receive the same reward. In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that the fulfillment, the complete fulfillment of the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12 or 22 or 18, was it? 
1718 or 1818, something like that. Yeah, so that the full promise that's given must include the Gentiles also. Because if the Gentiles are not a part of it, then it's not complete. And I think that's what he's getting across here uh, in verse 14, that as the Gentiles are brought into it, that completes it so that we as well receive the promised spirit through faith. All right, that's as far as um, we have time for tonight. Unless, am I, am I, what time does our class end? I don't really even know. Any moment. Yeah, that's what I figured. So, um, all right, well, let's try to get through verses 15 through 18 just real quick then. No, I'm kidding. Uh, all right, good class, guys. It's a good discussion. I know there's probably um, questions on some of this. Think about it. Uh, through this week, come back, ask the questions if we need to clarify anything. And then we will move on uh, from there as well and uh, get into some of these probably more popular, more well-known of uh, discussion points in Galatians. So, all right. Thanks a lot, guys. Good class.